Oh, okay, let's see. Share screen. Uh, no. Okay, now you go ahead and uh, enter that. Wow. Good Lord, there's a billion photos. Okay. You scroll from the very top to look for the first link. Uh, you might have to copy the password too. Let's see. Um, personal Hey, nope, nope. I don't have time for that right now. Do I go into your text and do it, or do I go to Zoom? Go to your text. Put it in the text and click on the link there. And go through here. Right here. Yeah, but you needed to get the password first. Yeah, we'll just cancel. Go into text. Please only input the following calendar. No uh, bark. Cosmo. No bark. No bark. No That's bark. The one you want. No. Nope. See right there, it says Zoom. Zoom, that's what you're going to do. Now I gotta find the password. Zero zero two eight hundred. Zero zero two eight hundred. Nope. Thank you, Jim. Good boy. Good boy. Recording in progress. progress. Yes. Definitely, definitely. Is this your camera from the device and right you're sitting on this class of camera? No, I need to do that. Device and right you're sitting on this class of camera. Okay, so it is showing. Okay, so that's the other. You can go ahead and sign out now. Thanks, dude. And yeah. that's like it's working now, too. Are you in? Mm -hmm. I think that's about huh? the little smartness thing is it moves back and forth. And Do it again? It, it automatically like pans a little bit, stuff like that's kind of weird. Hey, Alex. Hello. How's it going? All right. Uh, sorry, it took me a little while. I had uh, I had some problems last night uh, with Zoom. My, uh, computer died yesterday and i had to go out like at the middle of the day and go buy a brand new computer and i got connected with zoom literally at like 5 18 and my class started at 5 20 but my ipad wouldn't work and i just have found a fix so i was trying to get my wife to help me make sure the fix was working <laughs> oh, no. it'll be working now hopefully <laughs> <laughs> It's normal class today, correct? Next week yes. is the one that is just for questions and stuff. Yes, that's correct. Okay. If you need it, I mean, obviously we can we can do other stuff, but yeah, I'm available during our normal class time. I'm also available during the day at school, uh, uh, Monday, 
and Tuesday if anybody needs it and I can make appointments and that sort of thing. Okay. Very cool. And then um, I, it's probably not, but I'll ask anyway. I didn't see it anything on the syllabus. The final exam is mandatory, right? It doesn't take like away one of our uh, other exam grades or anything like that. Yeah, there's no. Uh, basically, I'm one of old school people, and uh, there seems to be some evidence that regrouping and restudying everything just before the end is actually pedagogically helpful. So yeah, I don't I don't do anything where you can get out of taking the final because the final is such a big help in terms of learning. Okay, all right, just wanted to check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't blame you. It's not necessarily a fun thing. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, I did start grading the uh, midterm redos. I, 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 well, actually, I'd already started, but uh, today I started putting them in. So you might see those up there now. Uh, as well as I've also put all the practice tests in and the regular tests. Uh, I think I might still have to put a practice test for uh, Respondus so you can make sure your Respondus is working. I'm not sure if I've done that yet, but that'll come up soon. Okay. And you're one of the teachers that prefers us to show uh, around the room, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Or okay. at least like your air, what they call the lungeable distance. So anywhere, anything you can reach. I okay. do give your laptop and show under the desk and under that and all that good stuff. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure. The instructions that will be on the actual exam, they will be available to you as well uh, when you do the practice one for Respondus. So you actually get a chance to see exactly what I'm requiring of you. Okay. And there's two online tests left or is there only one? I think I put up two. Okay. So I okay. put up two or three. And uh, either way, one of them is going to be optional. I'd recommend you take it anyways, but it's optional just because I didn't want to stress anybody out about, you know, having to rapidly finish two tests or something like that. <laughs> is it optional, but extra credit or just optional? It's it's optional in the sense that uh, I am going to drop now instead of one online test, I'm going to drop two. So uh, if you choose to take it, then it's just going to, if that's higher than your lowest test, then your lowest test will be thrown away. Or okay. actually, your two lowest tests will be thrown away. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. It's optional in that sense. Let me double check that and see if I'm remembering correctly, because that would be kind of helpful to know, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Brianna, do you have any questions or anything? we got a little bit of time for class starts. I got my Mandalorian stuff up there. No, I don't have any questions. Okay. I am now checking. So it looks like, yes, I've made practice tests six, seven, and eight. Uh, six is the one that's due this Sunday, but seven and eight are due on April 30th. And I don't know why the practice midterm is up there. Oh, and I wrote practice midterm many times. Let me see if I can. Oh, crap. People have already taken it. I wonder if that is the midterm. I'm just realizing that I copied something, and I'm, I'm thinking that might actually be a midterm, not a practice final, uh, looking in the practice test module. So I might have actually made another midterm instead of a final. I need to check that to make sure. <laughs> That's kind of a bummer. <laughs> But I was I was doing like 15 things this morning. So this is a good probability that I literally just took the wrong test and made it into a practice final. Yep, that's what I did. I do have one question. Yes, ma'am. Go for it. Is the the test is going to be over the last few chapters we've gone over, or is it over everything? The final is a comprehensive. Uh so yeah, it will cover everything from the beginning of the semester to uh through the chapters we covered this week and stuff. So for you guys, that'll be chapters one through 11, chapter 14, chapter 15, and then uh, chapter 36. I had to double check what class I was looking at. Yeah, this midterm that's up there is nothing. I don't even know why it's there. Uh, so I've got to take that down, which is kind of a bummer because it seems like some people have already taken it. Oh, no, it's March 15th, so that's okay. But I remember writing, take this one multiple times. Uh, oh, well, that's weird. I'm going 
going to remove that from here. Oh, it just appeared twice. Okay, that's cool. Whew, scare me. So I did already take uh, practice final exam take once. That's already there. So I've already got the one for Respondents Lockdown Browser. I just don't have the other one up. So I guess that'll be something I'm doing pretty quickly after class, hopefully. Uh, we got still about nine minutes for class starts. My, uh, I, I, like I said, I bought a new computer, but evidently it's a little smarter. And either that or Zoom is up. They don't know if Zoom's doing this or what. Hey, who put my baby Yoda over there? Look, I got a baby Yoda. <laughs> uh, is is does your Zoom do this now, or is this just something that my Mac? Are you on an iPad? Uh, no, I'm actually on a, a, a well, I'm on an Apple computer. It's Mac Mini, uh, which I had an iMac before. But all of a sudden, I started using it. Now the camera is following me. Check it out. Because I think my FaceTime does that, too. Oh, really? Um, well, I don't know if it's Zoom or FaceTime, but I think FaceTime does it, too. Yeah, that might be, because I do notice that uh, my operating system was uh, a couple versions behind, because this one is, what is this? This is Ventura, and I was like on Monterey or something that started with M, whose name I can't remember. So it might just be the new OS. I noticed they were advertising for the latest OS, which is even more advanced than the Ventura that I have. That one has these neat features for FaceTime and some neat features for texting. So that's exciting. <laughs> I did have another question real quick. Um, I noticed in like the mastering physics, we have a ton of assignments that are due on the 30th of April. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's correct, I'm guessing. Like all of that, like chapter 12, 13, 15, 14. Yeah, but they're all extra credit, even if I didn't mark them. So, okay, all of them are extra credit. Okay. Yeah, let me uh, let me type down here at the bottom what which ones are extra credit versus which ones aren't. So Perfect. Uh, only the following are not extra that's chapter one through 11 14 15 and 36 so anything outside of that i just put it in our uh in our chat Anything outside of 1 through 11, 14, 15, 36, that's extra credit, uh, even though I didn't get a chance to mark them. So you don't have to do them. And in fact, if, you, if you've if you got like a 100 average or a homework average that you're happy with, I wouldn't even bother doing them except for the advantage you get of learning a lot more material than uh, was actually required of you. And that might help you in the future. But if you're just going to like go on and 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 look up the answers and that sort of thing, that's not that's not going to be much learning. So I wouldn't waste my time with it. And I'm not trying to be like. So it's a homework student. extra credit. Yeah, it's a homework yeah. extra credit. Okay. Okay. The, the way those extra credits work, in case you didn't recall, is each time I make one of those, I increase the number of dropped homework assignments by one. So I'm supposed to drop one by itself. Uh, I mean, already just from the syllabus. I think my last count, I got up to four that I've graded. What that means is one of them is the one from the syllabus. And then uh, the introduction to my lab and mastering is another and the physics primer is another. And then I went through and graded one of the extra credits. So that's the fourth one. So uh, tonight or tomorrow, I'll be putting in that I'm dropping four of the lowest online homeworks. And uh but I have to put in zeros for all those columns beforehand. So anybody that didn't turn in is going to get a zero, but they're also getting a, another grade drop. So that's the way that'll work. I know, uh, Alex, you were one that had uh, an extra credit done. Uh, I think I left you a note in there as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Your last name's like something with a G, right? A kind of yes. Yeah. Gregorio. Gregorio. That's it. Yeah. I remembered it was, it looked like it could be foreign, but might not. <laughs> yeah. It's Greek. <laughs> oh, gotcha. That's a, that's a few number of syllables for a Greek name. <laughs> a lot of syllables <laughs> in Greek names. Polypopolis. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have some friends from Greece, and I have some other friends from uh, Cyprus as well. My father is from Cyprus. 
Is he? Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. He came Beautiful. here originally to study at ODU because Cyprus doesn't have any universities and he decided to stay here. So a girl that was in grad school with me, she uh she was from Cyprus and she went to Brown. I mean, you know, freaking Ivy League school, and she did really well. But uh, she she didn't want to go back to Cyprus yet. She wanted to continue her education. So she decided the first school, that grad school that wrote her back and offered her uh, assistantship for grad school, she'd take it. And the poor girl, I mean, she went to Brown, so she didn't have to go to necessarily a, a, a lower end school. Not that they were that bad, but it mm -hmm. uh, she went on to East Carolina, which was where I uh, did my bachelor's and actually did a master's too. But uh, she ended up going there just because they were the first people to offer her money, which is kind of funny because like I said she I mean coming from Brown she could have probably went to Princeton she probably could have went to Yale but she just said, no I don't, I don't want to get stuff out here but <laughs> she's doing really well because she likes medical physics and that's that's what their specialty was they do uh medical physics where you can uh assist doctors in calculating the symmetry how much you know dose of radiation or whatever you get for given cancer given certain parameters it's a, it's a pretty interesting field of physics very cool Hmm. Yep. So that's my that's my lone friend from uh, from Cyprus. Everybody else I know is from Greece. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had it. What's it called? Uzo. <laughs> that's a good drink. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Have you tried Kumanderia? No, uh, but I, I am familiar with it just because I was out one day at uh, actually there's a Greek restaurant on Kempsville and. Uh, they offered that to me. I ended up knocking it over, so I didn't get to get to have a sip. <laughs> but yeah, that's 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 next on my list. It's a very good wine. It's very it? good. Cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's next on my list of languages. I'm currently learning uh, Latin. Uh, after that, I want to uh, do ancient Greece. Uh, ancient mm. Greece. So can, uh, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to read. Uh, Odysseus and all that good stuff. So hopefully that'll be cool. And I would like to read the Old Testament, but that's, uh, I mean, the New Testament, but that's uh, Attic Greek, which is a slightly different. Mm, very cool. Yep. Anybody else have any questions since I'm just shooting the breeze here, waiting for the next uh, two minutes to come by? Oh, there it is. I'd lost all my participants. Those of you who are just coming in, I did post on the chat the chapters that are actually going to be on your final exam, uh, and they're also the chapters that are not extra credit. So everything else that you see on my lab and mastering, other than those chapters 1 through 11, 14, 15, and 36, all those other chapters are uh, extra credit. So you're not required to do them, and in fact, as I was telling the students a second ago, the way my extra credit works, if your homework grade is, uh, you know, somewhere you like it, like in the 90s, upper 90s or whatever, there's not much impetus to do additional homeworks, except for the learning that you could possibly get. But if you're just uh, going to do them by, you know, looking stuff up, that's very limited in learning. So I wouldn't put much time in that. I'd focus more on doing well on your final. I did tell them I have uh, all three of the last three tests are posted. You can do those. Uh, but I did make the last one. Uh, all right. I made uh, the number of dropped online tests increase to two instead of one. So uh, you don't have to feel so stressed that you got, quote unquote, three tests to do. Now you can uh, you, you just have to do two. But if you have time to do three, I've given you till the 30th to finish them. To finish the other two and that will replace your lowest grade professor younger a couple things um one i don't see it in the chat the chapters that you posted okay let me do that again then uh also someone mentioned this about uh there it is someone mentioned this about what was it oh maybe it's because i sent it to there it is, everyone. Okay, someone mentioned about only uh, eight, eight and a certain number of pages in their redo. Uh, the person that I had mentioned, which I suspect is you that posted it, uh, 
when I was going through the pages, there was like, there was definitely all the pages were there, but three of them were just black and it wouldn't do anything. And I tried reloading and reloading. Uh, it might be something where just if I open it back up now, it might work. I'll, I will check it uh, as soon as I can. But if you resubmit the pages that I'm missing, uh, that, that'll uh, fix the problem, hopefully. But yeah, it did come up black. The pages were there, but it just showed black like I couldn't access it, which is weird. But I did notice just before the last student I got to, one page went black and then blinked back up and came up right. So it might be something where I just go back in and it'll start working for me. So that was not me, but you did mention that you didn't see one of my solutions because you said I had to draw a free body diagram and I did oh, all yeah. that. Um, I don't know how, why you weren't seeing it, but when I went back in it, it was definitely popping up for me. Um, yeah, that shouldn't have been you then. Uh, basically, I did that with about four different people. It looked like they just started with an equation for the friction for or for the force that had coefficients of friction in it. So I didn't see any work where you had like multiple versions of Newton's second law, and then you put them together to get something with the mu's in it. And that that was a uh, basically you just weren't showing me enough work for me to uh, see that you really understood how to do it. And there was like I said, there was like four people that had a, a difficulty with that, uh, or I said difficulty, they had something that just suggested to me that it didn't look like they did it. They might've found a solution and just copied what the answer was. But if you only had like one or two equations, chances are uh, you haven't shown me enough work. Yeah, I had a few on there. So um, okay. you could see if maybe if it comes back, if it comes up or I could send it to you separately. No um, problem. But the other thing I was gonna bring up was I did email you um, a couple of times about um, the practice final for mm -hmm. my Canvas page that I'm pulling up. It right. appears that you posted, you reposted the practice midterm and then <laughs> posted a practice final for Respondus. Yeah, that's what I was just discovering. So there's I'm not like a regular students. practice final. Yeah, that'll be up in a few, uh, or that'll be up tonight. Basically, I, I thought I made it, uh, but I was doing like 15 things at the time. So I think I inadvertently put up uh, uh, the midterm again. So I, I will fix that, post that, and I'll email everybody when it's up and working again. Uh, you can take the respondents one, and I don't care if you take it more than once, uh, and you will get some use out of it. It's just that's not the one that's going to be graded. So uh, I don't know that it's that helpful, but it, it is actually a real practice test that will be helpful to your preparation for the final. It's just convoluted because you got to do a stupid respond this thing okay thanks. thanks for that video anybody else have any questions it's about time for us to get started otherwise okay so uh what i wanted to do was uh talk a little bit bit more about chapter 14 let me open up this. I should have done this already, but I didn't because I'm a goober. Uh, well, I didn't mean to do that, but here I am. So <laughs> there we go. I got that. What I'm doing real quick is I'm trying to pull up the text so I can look at chapter 14 because it was an example that I wanted to do for you guys from chapter 14. I think there was. I'm going to double check. If not, I'm just going into chapter 15 to show it to you. But I, I think I had a chapter 14 example I wanted to show you. Uh, I have managed to get my iPad to start working, so I'm kind of uh, happy about that. I had to buy a new computer yesterday, and uh, things were not easy. Let's see. What was it? Okay, so I think the last thing I did was a physical pendulum. I want to check my notes real quick, too, just since I've got them. Yeah, okay, yeah, so I did the physical pendulum last time. What I really wanted you guys to see was how I could uh, readily take a differential equation and uh, use that to make some grandiose conclusions about what the solution was. So let me start off by just showing you that. I'm going to share my screen. 
and I'm going to remind you what we know, and then I'm going to quickly do some neat work. So here's my... Oh, great. Now it's going to act like it won't work. Come on. Maybe that worked. Okay, now it's doing something weird. Are you guys seeing my uh, blank graph paper right now? No. Great. That's cool. It just says starting screen sharing and just. This is what happened. Now. Ah, there you go. Oh, thank God. Hopefully it's working now. Okay. Zoom, Williams, iMac. I got that. Now you're seeing it? Yes. I think I, okay. Uh, the weird thing is new Mac now, because I have a Mac mini, uh, which has a computer, and then I have a fancy monitor. Uh, so now when I go to connect it, it actually has two different devices. And if you do one, y'all can't see it. You do the other, it works. But yesterday, I couldn't do the other. So here is what we discovered. Uh, we started off with Newton's second law of motion, which says the summation of the forces is equal to this particular version that we're using is m d2x over dt squared for one-dimensional motion, right? Now, what that means for the harmonic oscillator, which is just a mass on a spring, is just m d2x over dt squared is equal to negative kx. So when you pull that over to the other side and divide through by m, you get d2x over dt squared plus k over m x is equal to zero. And what we discovered was that had a solution x of t is equal to a times the cosine of in this case, it was omega t plus phi, where the a and the phi were determined from the initial conditions. And there actually turns out to be what we call a characteristic equation that allows us to determine omega, and that omega is the square root of k over m now when we did that same thing for instance with the physical pendulum we ended up getting d2 theta over dt squared plus m g h over i making the small angle approximation that was times theta equals zero then we had the same thing, except now it's theta of t is equal to a cosine omega t plus phi. Only this time, omega was the square root of mgh over i. Okay, so y'all sort of getting what I'm talking about here. There was also the simple pendulum, and that one had d2 theta over dt squared. Plus, uh, when I actually pulled everything over and made uh, used the small angle approximation, that ended up giving me uh, g over l times theta is equal to zero. Of course, this was exactly the same solution again. A cosine omega t plus phi, where this time omega was the square root of g over L, where L is the length of the pendulum. So I, I, I suspect you guys are seeing a pattern. Does that make sense? Would y'all agree that you've definitely seen a pattern here? Anybody have any questions about that? All right, well, we went to the next level. Uh, as uh, Spinal Tap would say, we turned it up to 11. And when we turned it up to 11, we got this cool thing. Basically, we had m d2x over dt squared uh, is equal to, now in this case, it was a mass on a spring. So we had Hooke's law, negative kx, 
but we also had a damping force. So we had, we were trying to show the fact that you know what really happens if I get a mass oscillating on a spring, uh, of course it goes like this, but over time it slowly decays into nothing. So we were trying to capture that. Well, it turns out the uh, drag force that we could use is just proportional to the velocity. And we called that constant of proportionality B. And in fact, it's negative B times the velocity. And the velocity is, of course, dx over dt. Well, this gave us an equation that was d2x over dt squared plus uh, b over m dx dt plus k over m x is equal to zero, which lo and behold gave us a slightly new solution, slightly different, and that's x of t is equal to a e to the negative b over 2m t times cosine omega prime t uh, plus phi. So again, the phi and the a come from initial conditions just like they did before, but we now have a different omega prime. That omega prime is the square root of k over m Notice that's just the coefficient in front of the x and then minus, oops, okay, my cat is going crazy, minus b squared over 4m squared. That's the new mu. And in fact, there was a case called underdamp. Allie. Sorry, that's my cat. I'm trying to calm her down. Under damp, then we have critically damp. And then we have over damped. Now your book will go through and tell you, as I did in class the other day. Oh, I don't know why I put an S there. As I did in class the other day, uh, it'll go through and tell you uh, exactly what conditions make overdamped, critically damped, and underdamped. I, I would just remind you that critically damp was the case when this whole quantity right here was equal to zero. So if you got the square root was equal to zero, that was the critically damped case. And uh, basically what it was is it turned out you couldn't get the two functions that you're supposed to for a second order differential equation. The E minus some constant times T plus the E uh, plus some constant times T because uh, the characteristic equation was a quadratic equation. The quadratic solution is negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC, all that over 2A. But that plus or minus square root is what in the plus case gives you one solution and in the minus case gives you the other. So uh, if you actually have that the thing under the square root is in fact zero, like I'm showing you here for the critically damp case, then you only have one solution. And that's just not acceptable for a second order differential equation. So if you were actually taking a differential equations class, what they would teach you is you can next multiply that by a polynomial. And the lowest order polynomial is one, or excuse me, it's it's a constant A plus another constant B, or let's say a constant C1 plus another constant C2 times T. Uh, and in this case, you'd end up multiplying parentheses one plus uh, T, close parentheses, times e to the answer that you got before. So that's basically the critical thing. As a uh, as preparation for your final exam, really you just need to know under what conditions you get overdamped, under what conditions you get underdamped, and under what conditions you get critically damped. Uh, they're actually stated in the book, but you should also be able to use initial conditions to figure out things like a and uh, b over 2m and phi. So that's where I'm going now. I'm going to show you an example 
of that. And the example is more or less the same as the uh, one in the textbook. So let me turn to that real quick. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to turn to an example. And the example is a simple pendulum uh, has a length. Whoa. I did not mean to do that. Has a length. L is equal to one point. I'm going to use two sig figs here, or three sig figs total. L equal to one meter. It is set swinging with a small amplitude. Stop it. A small amplitude, which I'll abbreviate with amp, uh, oscillation, which I'll abbreviate again, after 5.00 minutes, the amplitude is only 50.0% of its original value. Sorry about writing this in cursive, everybody. I'm just, that's the quickest way to write. And I didn't really want to write, to be honest with you. But anyways... Okay, so A, what they want to know is what is the value of gamma? So what do I mean by that? That means, let's write down here the solution. I'll, I'll finish the question in a second, of course, but I wanted to stop and let you know what gamma is because I didn't explicitly write it on the last slide. Uh, gamma is given by x of t is equal to a times e to the negative gamma t times cosine omega prime t plus five. Okay, so from what we saw earlier, clearly gamma is uh, b over 2m. Okay, so that's what I mean by gamma. Now I'll say part b. Uh by what factor actually do well that was crazy f and f prime differ okay so that's the problem we're trying to solve. We've got all our information that we really need, but this is a nice example of where we're using some initial conditions to figure out stuff. So let's start off with part A, where uh, they're really just asking you what is gamma. Now, it looks like we haven't been given nearly enough information. We know the equation was supposed to be d2x over dt squared but remember, that was for an actual uh, mass on the spring. So, in fact, I want to erase that now. In fact, we're not doing that. What we are doing is d2 theta, because this is a pendulum, over dt squared. Plus, now if you remember correctly, the case for d2 theta over dt squared for a regular pendulum is that guy right there. But now we're talking about damping. So we're going to have a term like this in it as well. So uh, what we're going to have is a G over L. 
and a B over L because you can see here with the B, if I divide both sides by L like I did up here, then that's going to become B over L. So this is where you're actually making use of the fact that I know what the differential equation is. Even though I don't necessarily know how to solve differential equations, I can still do this. So this is B over L D theta over DT plus, now here's the part where it's going to be G over L times theta is equal to zero. So now that tells us theta as a function of time is going to be the amplitude times E to the negative gamma T times cosine omega prime T plus five. So that's really the solution we're working for. Uh, now for the initial condition, they said at, whoa, at T equal 5.00 minutes, which by the way is equal to 300.0 with a bar under it seconds, then uh, X of T is equal to one half A, or you could just say 0 0.50 A. Well, actually I should probably use the number of sig figs that I wrote, 500 A. So that's really what's going on. So we're going to use that now. What we're going to do is we're going to say 0 0.500 A is X of T. And then A times E to the negative gamma times 300.0 uh, seconds like that. And then the cosine is just one when we're trying to estimate what the amplitude is supposed to be. So we're just finding whatever omega T plus phi happens, doesn't really matter, long as the omega T plus phi uh, equates to something like zero so that we'll get cosine being one. So now you can see that the A's cancel out in this equation. Is everybody following what I'm saying here? I'm not hearing much reverb or anything, so I wanna make sure I'm not blowing you guys away. Okay. All right. So we're trying to solve this now for gamma because that's what part uh, uh, A wants. So I've now got an equation. And what I'm going to do is take the natural log of both sides. So I'll take the natural log of 0 0.500. And notice the A's had already canceled out. Now I'm taking the natural log of E to the negative 300 seconds times gamma. Now, I happen to know, uh, as all good uh, physicists and engineers know, that the ln of 0 0.5 is negative 0 0.693, roughly. And then, of course, the natural log of e to the negative 300 seconds times gamma is, in fact, negative 300 point zero seconds times gamma. So I can now say that gamma is in fact equal to 0 0.693. Technically, I should probably use another sig fig. Uh, I don't recall the next sig fig, but I can do that real quick. Let's say uh, lin 0.5 is 6931. So I'll add another sig fig one. So that's one extra sig fig, so I don't feel so bad about what I'm doing. So I'm going to take that 6.6931. Uh, I'm going to divide that by 300.0 seconds. And that gives me zero point zero zero two three one zero, one extra sig fig, seconds to the negative one power. That is exactly what gamma should be. Okay. So we now know what gamma is. Uh, but in order for us to actually figure out omega, uh, or omega prime, 
then omega prime, we have to realize, is the square root of not k over m, but g over l minus b squared over 4l squared, like that. Hopefully, y'all can see how this solution right here becomes b over 4l squared and then after the negative in there because the differential equation changed from k over m to g over l and this one changed from b over m to b over l. That's really what we're doing here. And that's horrible looking, so I'm going to redo that. Yeah. And we'll make sure you click, see that that's an arrow. Okay. So does everybody follow how I made that new transition from the omega prime that we had for the spring to the omega prime that we actually have for the uh, pendulum? Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so what we have here is clearly we've got gamma, but we don't necessarily have enough to figure out what, uh, what omega prime is. Uh, what we do know is that gamma is going to be B over 2L. So you can write this omega prime as, in fact, the square root of just plain omega squared minus, in this case, B squared over 4L squared is, in fact, gamma squared. Now, if you actually put in these numbers, as I did earlier, uh, this is what you're going to get. Uh, you're going to get the square root of 9.79999 and then some other digits. Uh, excuse me, I, wrote, I was supposed to write a 9 there. So uh, you're going to get basically the square root of 9.7999. Obviously, that's not sanctioned by the number of sig figs we have. So it's really not a reasonable answer. But the main thing is you can see it's very close to just being G over L because G is 9.8 meters per second per second and L is one meter. So uh, that's what's actually going on here. But a technique that we use uh, often in physics, science, engineering in general is that uh, something called the binomial theorem and basically what the binomial theorem tells us is this nice little Maclaurin series expansion. You can say one plus or minus X raised to the N power is one plus or minus N times X plus. Now, here's where it goes on further and further and further. This next one would be n times n minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared. Then the next one, I think, is plus or minus n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 over 3 factorial x cubed uh, plus dot, dot, dot. So you see if... If, in fact, the X in here, this X right here, if X is less than 1, then uh, X squared is way, way smaller than X, and X, square, uh, X cubed is way, way smaller than X uh, squared, so you can justify erasing some terms. So that's what we do when we get things like that. But in order for me to do that, I need to transform that omega prime into a one plus X to the N power. So now I'm gonna do that. Let me show you how. So what I've got is omega prime is equal to the square root of omega minus uh, gamma. 
Uh, and I think that's gamma squared, actually. So it's omega squared minus gamma squared. Did I write it that way before? Yes, I did. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, for starters, I am going to say that is equal to uh, omega squared minus gamma squared to the one-half power. Now I'm going to go a little further, and I'm going to be crazy and factor out a square root of omega squared. And then that's going to leave a 1 right here minus gamma over omega squared to the 1 half power. Everybody follow what I did there? Anybody have any questions on that? Now, what this means is omega prime over omega is actually equal to 1 minus gamma over omega squared to the 1 half power. And I'm going to say 1 minus gamma over omega squared to the 1 half power is approximately, according to this theorem down here, it's approximately equal to 1 minus uh, gamma over omega. Well, actually, let me give it a little bit of space first. The n is 1 half, and then I'm going to write gamma over omega squared like that. So everybody follow what I did? So this is going to be 1 minus 1 half. Now I'm going to take omega, or excuse me, gamma over omega. Well, gamma, we can see was, uh, or gamma squared, I should say. Gamma was 0 0.00231. If I wish to square that, and I do, then I get 5.338 times 10 to the negative 6. So I'll get uh, 5.338 times 10 to the negative 6 over, now omega squared. Uh, do I actually need omega squared or do I need omega? That should be omega. I pulled that out. That made that omega squared. And yes, that should be 9.80. Uh, this is S. This is seconds to the negative 1 uh, squared, actually, over 9.80 squared times S to the negative 2 as well. So the units cancel out, and I get 1. Minus, oh, I got to multiply that by one half. 2.779, that's one extra sig fig again, times 10 to the negative 8 uh, is what that's supposed to be. So omega prime over omega is supposed to be one point zero 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 uh that should be well this should be enough minus zero point one two three four five six seven two seven seven nine like that so you can see what this ultimately becomes is uh, you can make this into zero point, basically uh, one zero if you want, but you can basically going to get nine, 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 
minus basically uh, 0.0000000279. I'll leave uh, this one off. So let me get rid of that guy. Like that. And you can see that that number comes out really small. 9 minus 9 is 0. 9 minus 7 is 2. 9 minus 7 is 2. 9 minus 2 is 7. 9 minus 0 uh, is 9. So we're going to get 9, 9, 9. And then we're going to get 9, 9, 9. So you can see that it differs very, very much, uh, very, very little. In other words, this number is very, very close to one. Any questions on that? All right, so that's just another example of how we can actually uh, convert one differential equation that we learned into another, into another, into another. The general solution is quite straightforward. And in fact, you can even up the ante a little bit so, for instance, your uh, book shows this as well. But what happens is we now have an equation of the form d2x over dt squared plus uh, this originally became k over m times dx, or excuse me, not k over m. This one became B over M times DX over DT plus K over M times X is equal to zero. That allowed us to say, well, X is equal to A E to the negative B over 2 M T times cosine omega prime T plus phi where omega prime was the square root of k over m minus b squared over 4m squared, like that. So we've gotten that. But now your book ups the ante just a little bit, and I need you to understand the concept behind this. I'm not necessarily on, I mean, I might on a test, but not on a final exam. I'm not going to make you solve this. But what your book does is say, what about if we had this equation? Remember, I told you this was a homogeneous second order ordinary linear differential equation. But now I'm going to up the ante a little bit and make this be equal to F0 times cosine of let's say omega zero t okay now it's inhomogeneous or non-homogeneous okay well what the heck do we do with that that seems like a whole nightmare and nothing that we could ever possibly figure out but in fact uh we can in fact your book is kind enough and, and literally this is the first book i had found that gave it to us other than in a problem uh this one at least gives it to you within the chapter but what it does is it says, okay, well, this is easy enough. If you want to, uh, if you want to actually work out what the solution is, uh, all you have to do is now say the solution is actually not going to be one that decays. It's not necessarily going to have that e to the negative b over two m. In fact, what it's going to have is a different solution uh, where x of t is equal to a uh, sine. Now, they don't necessarily say this, uh, but it's going to be a sine omega t. But they leave off the phi. That's the part that I say they don't normally say. But they give you the added point that A is going to be the F0 that you found divided by the square root of omega minus or omega squared minus omega 0 squared plus B 
squared omega. Well, actually, I'm not writing that very well. Let me back up and fix it. So this is going to be B squared omega squared over M squared like that. So that's how A comes out. And in fact, they'll go even further by letting us know that phi in this situation is going to be the inverse tangent of omega zero squared minus omega squared over omega times B over M. So what I want you to be able to do is, yes, obviously in homework problems and in uh, even online tests, you can quickly look up this answer and just plug these things in. That'll be fine. But on the final, what I really care about is you realizing that, hey, this amplitude A uh, sort of has, you know, some value that's related to F0, which is the magnitude of the uh, force that we're using to force the oscillations in the inhomogeneous equation. But we can actually make the amplitude get quite a bit larger by making omega and omega zero really close to each other. And that's why if you make a graph, say, so let me, uh, let me use this little box as part and let me get rid of that. Uh, then if you make a graph of A, what you'll get is a simple little function like that, but as omega approaches omega zero, you'll get a really high peak there. And that's basically resonance. So this is sort of like uh, when you get on a swing set. Remember, I just finished showing you literally on the last problem how a pendulum is just like a mass on a spring. Well, uh, a swing set is just a pendulum. So if you're on an actual swing set and you're swinging back and forth, you can actually put a force into it to some extent by swinging your legs back and forth and doing some other things. And you probably learned, hopefully as a kid, how to do that, how you can start uh, on a swing set without someone pushing you and slowly increase the amplitude of the swing that you're doing by kicking your legs in some kind of resonant fashion. If you actually kick your legs in that resonant fashion, then you can force your magnitude of your swing to get larger and larger and larger. And that's what this is showing. Okay. Your book even talks about the uh, Q value and the Q value is basically when resonance, uh, well, it's a measure of how close you are to resonance. And in this case, the resonance or the Q value is given to be, is equal to uh, basically omega zero over omega minus omega zero. Okay. So as you get omega minus omega zero closer and closer to each other or omega minus omega zero closer and closer to zero, Q gets really, really large. So that's all that is. And you can actually look in your book. It does say ultimately that in terms of the differential equation uh, and the initial conditions, Q is M omega zero over B. So all I care about far as the final goes is you conceptually understanding that that's resonance and you being able to apply these initial conditions to this differential equation and now we've completely finished with chapter 14. Anybody have any questions on that? Oh, uh, what does Q equal? Like all the letters? It's a little hard to read. Okay, yeah. So uh, let me zoom in on it for 
that's the that's one value of of a way we can calculate q is we take the omega zero which is what i use to cite the force the frequency of the force of oscillation that's being put in versus the the resonant the regular frequency that comes from the circuit is regular omega but you can also see over here which i think is the part you were asking about this one down here that's m times omega zero omega sub zero over b and that wouldn't hurt for me to clean it up a little bit so let me do that too so m, thank you no problem m times omega zero over b is what q is everybody follow that all right now's the next part and i've sort of given you some of the details are uh, previously throughout the semester about uh, wave motion. Uh, but let me explain something to you. I'm going to stop sharing for a second if I can figure out how. How do I stop sharing? Oh, there it is. Gotcha. Okay, so what we learned about in Chapter 14 was oscillations. And oscillations is basically something that goes back and forth in space. Okay. So, if, or well, I should say back and forth uh, in a linear dimension over time. So, basically, if you made a plot of X versus T for a spring, it would go as time went forward. Uh, a wave is sort of the same thing. It's an oscillation, but it's an oscillation in space and time. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is if you watch any particular point in space, say right here, then what you're going to see is this wave come through and uh, basically carry energy from point A to point B. Not necessarily carrying any matter. That's a key point. You don't have to carry mass for it to be a wave. You just have to carry energy. And in fact, a uh, a wave like you do in a football stadium is uh, technically not due to any physical laws, but due basically to psychology. It is a wave because what happens with a wave in a stadium is the person next to you will stand up and raise their hands. Well, guess what? The center of mass of that human is right about where their belly button is. When they're sitting down, the center of mass is quite low. When they stand up, it moves up. So what that represents by that person standing up is a potential energy increasing. So energy actually increased for the person next to you. Now, chances are, if you're on the same or a supporter of the same team as the person next to you, then you're probably going to stand up as well. So as soon as he stands up and then starts to sit back down, you're going to stand up and start to sit back, and then they're going to start to sit back down. So now your potential energy went up as this potential energy is going down. And then when this potential energy of you starts to go down, then this potential energy of the person to your other side of you is going to go up. And it'll keep on doing that all the way around the stadium. Sometimes I've seen at football games where it goes around 12 times. Okay. So there's no law of physics that requires the linking of the energy of this person to the energy of this person to the energy of this person. But there is something that happens, some phenomena in uh, psychology that compels us to do that. Now, uh, I, for instance, went to the NC State uh, East Carolina game when uh, East Carolina and NC State finally started playing each other again. And that was at NC State for the first one. The previous one had been like 20 years before and we beat them, even though we were pretty uh, not ranked and even in a, in, a, in a different division of football. So we ended up winning. And then, of course, our, our students didn't act like the most upstanding students. They went out on the field and tore down the uh, field goal. And then NC State said they would never play us again. So we had gone for like 20 years or whatever without playing them. But this was our reintroduction and they were sort of our nemesis and we won and I was there, but I had had to buy some scalp tickets and I was lucky enough to get on the 50 yard line, but uh, it was the 50 yard line on the side with the NC state people. So I was, you know, one of the people that psychology didn't compel to stand up when they were trying to make a wave, but I am here to report to you that 
East Carolina did win that game. And then the very, uh, that was the one, that was actually the second one. The first one was that actually at the Carolina Panthers Stadium and we kicked their butt there too, even though it was, I think we got like seven inches of rain that night and Junior Smith uh, ran for like 390 yards uh, despite all the rain. So that was kind of cool. Now, what's the big deal with this? Well, the difference here is we actually had uh, in the oscillations that we did in the previous chapter, uh, X as a function of time was A times cosine omega T, right? Or when we did damping, it was A times E to the negative B over 2MT times cosine omega T plus phi. And both of them actually had plus phi in there. That, that, that phi and that A gives us the ability to fit, uh, basically any possible uh initial conditions so what we're going to do now is try to make uh make a equivalent type of uh analysis but with waves as opposed to oscillations so first off i'm going to tell you some information about waves I'm going to tell you, for instance, what their characteristics is. I've already talked to you about uh, the wave equation in general, and, and I'll write that down now uh, just as soon as I can share my screen again. So let me share my screen, go here, go there. Now, a lot of what I'm talking about here is just basically us, uh, me talking about what, what concepts you need. The actual problems in this chapter are essentially just applying these equations and applying them sort of like what, what we did in chapter 14, where you have initial conditions. In other words, that's the part that I really care about, that and the concepts. So uh, you don't have to worry, at least, especially regarding the final, too much about anything other than the concepts and what I'd call plug and chug formulas. So first off, the wave equation. So the real wave equation is a second order uh, partial differential equation, and I'm just going to write it down so you'll know more or less what it looks like, but it's the second partial of D. This D is whatever's doing the oscillating. So, for instance, if we're talking about an ocean wave, it's the uh, height Y of the ocean wave, where uh, Y equals zero corresponds to sea level, okay? So, it's the second partial of that with respect to X squared is equal to one over v squared times the second partial again of that d but this time with respect to time squared okay so that is the nature of a differential equation uh that is a wave equation so this is the the real wave equation And therefore, anytime we as physicists and also, you know, engineers uh, see this equation, they know that they have something that they understand. They say, basically say, well, hey, if I, uh, since I have this differential equation behave, uh, that turned out like this, I know it's going to behave just like every other way we studied in physics, Okay. And what wave is that? Well, that wave is basically D is equal to some amplitude times. Now, in this case, uh, it all depends what, uh, what your author chooses to do. But in general, you could say sine or cosine. Uh, I'm going to say sine this time. And I'm going to say sine. Now, notice it's not going to be omega t. It's actually going to be something slightly different. It's going to be kx minus omega t. And then I'm going to add a phi to it, which, again, your textbook author has been leaving off mostly since we got to forced motion uh, in Chapter 14. But, again, for a second-order differential equation, you need two constants to be able to evaluate. Now, what is this K thing? Uh, I suspect you probably have an idea what is this omega thing. But in fact, what we know is omega is equal to 2 pi F. And we also know that F is equal to 1 over T. 
So this is kind of remarkable. If I put those two together, what I get is omega is equal to 2 pi over t. And I've mentioned it to you before that uh, sort of the time of an oscillation is like the uh, is like the wavelength. In other words, if you consider a wave to be, say, the graph of sine from zero to two pi, then this distance from here to here in meters is lambda. And that has units of meters. But if you look and say, well, how long did that take? Then you're talking about the period and the period is in seconds. So period and wavelength are very closely related. Period is the amount of time it takes for a wave to repeat itself in time, and wavelength is the distance you must go along a wave for it to repeat itself. So that's kind of interesting, especially once you realize that K, the wave number, not to be confused with Boltzmann constant and not to be confused with the spring constant. It's called the wave number. And it is in fact two pi over lambda. So you could in principle write D is equal to A times the sine of two pi now we're going to say x over lambda minus t over the period, and that would be true too. Okay? Now, if you actually put this equation in there, what you'll actually get is v is equal to omega over k, and of course omega is 2 pi over the period, but k is 2 pi over the wavelength. So we get that the two pi's cancel out and we end up getting wavelength over the period, but using f is equal to one over the period, we get that that's wavelength times frequency, which we sort of already knew hopefully. So velocity equals wavelength times frequency. That's sort of what we call the kindergarten wave, wave occasion, equation. Now, the key point to understand with this and all the chapter, uh, all of chapter 15, is that velocity of a wave is in general a square root of a force parameter divided by a density parameter. I'm getting 12 calls from Rocket Mortgage a day now. That's nice. Uh, parameter. Okay, what I mean by that is the density of the actual medium in which the wave is uh, traveling or propagating. That's the word we use for traveling. So that is the general rule for what a velocity of a wave is. And notice once you find the velocity of the wave, that doesn't change unless you change the material it's going through uh, by changing the force parameter, of course. Uh, you change the, the material. Uh, or by changing the material, you change the density parameter. So for instance, for velocity of a wave on a string, you get the square root of the tension divided by the mass per unit length. So this one's tension. That looks like a force, right? And this one is the mass over the length, which, uh, well, you haven't seen it yet, but uh, you will next semester. 
Uh, that's a typical one. Now, if you're talking about the uh, velocity of a surface wave, you get the square root of, let's say, Young's modulus over the density of the fluid. You can look that up in previous chapters, Young's modulus. That is, in fact, something that's related to how strong something is when you try to compress it or stretch it. Uh, and I don't know why that. Oh, I see why. Sorry. Okay. And if you wanted to know what the velocity of a wave is through a fluid, like, for instance, sound going through water, that turns out to be the bulk modulus divided by the density. Again, a force parameter. The bulk modulus, like the Young's modulus, is a force parameter. Now, in this case, this is literally the regular density. So, uh, for instance, kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, if we look at the fluid, this is an interesting uh, application that I want you guys to know. So, uh, it turns out when you're scuba diving, uh, sound is what we call omnidirectional. It means it's coming from all directions. Here's the reason. Uh, when you're born, you come out of the womb and your ear slowly combines with your brain to make sense of the world. And through a series of experiments that you didn't really plan, but that happened, uh, your, your mind has correlated that when you hear a sound come, say, from over here, uh, it arrives at this ear first and then there's a certain amount of delay then it arrives at that ear and when it's here it's about the same amount of time uh that it appears at, uh, that it uh occurs in each ear and then when it's over here it uh hits say this ear first and then this ear and so on and so forth so over time your body's learned hey if a sound comes from over here I expect this sound and then this sound and vice versa. So over time you've learned, oh, I can tell roughly where, what direction a sound comes from. Now, when you go underwater, your initial thought is looking at this equation. Well, wow, the density of air is like one kilogram or 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter. And the density of water is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. So you see that little row in the bottom of the velocity uh, of a wave through a fluid. And you say, okay, well, wow, the velocity must really slow down in water. And if that was the only factor, you'd be right. But it turns out that bulk modulus matters too. And the bulk modulus for air is in fact, uh, quite a bit smaller than the bulk modulus for water, uh, literally on the order of a factor of 100,000 or a million. So yeah, the density goes up and that's in the bottom. So that means the velocity goes down as a result of the density of the fluid. But as a result of the modulus, the modulus goes up for water, which would be this way, and that, of course, increases the velocity this way and, in fact, completely overburdens uh, the change that, that happened as a result of the density. So what ultimately happens is the speed of sound underwater is on the order of maybe eight or nine times faster. I can't remember what the numbers are. I haven't taken scuba diving in a long time uh, where we did learn it and I haven't done the calculation in a long time, but basically it's much faster. So what happens when your buddy tries to tell you, hey, there's a great white shark over there is he takes his dive, belt, uh, dive knife and, and bangs it on his metal tank and you hear a tech, tech, tech and doesn't matter because it arrives at both ears equally quickly. So you have no idea what direction it's coming from. If you're being a good diver, and that means you, one, have a partner, you know, never dive alone. And two, your partner is staying in such a uh, distance from you and proximity from you that you always have your eyes on each other then you both know exactly where he is and you can see what they're pointing at. But if you're not doing that, then you have no idea where the great white shark is and he's just going to bite you. Okay. 
All right. So that's some neat little conditions uh, that happen with uh, strings, uh, uh, with, with waves. So now we know some formulas. These formulas can be looked up. Of course, you're also allowed uh, to put them on your equation sheet for your final exam. Of course, the uh, the remaining tests, they're, you know, open book, open notes, open Google searches. So you can use that all day long. That's not a big deal. All these equations can be used and they're pretty much plug and chug equations. OK, so I don't really need you to, to uh, do much more complicated problems than this. Uh, I do need you to understand that the velocity of the wave is fixed, and that means the frequency and wavelength for a given wave and a given material have a always have to be inversely related. What's your question on that? Uh, don't the velocity of the sound uh, sometimes depend on the temperature? Ah, very good. Nice one, Kamala. Yeah, in fact, that is a parameter because it turns out air has a density being a gas that's a, that's a big thing that's why the ideal gas law is so much different than the than the uh density for a liquid or a solid but yes because air has a density that's uh related to temperature yeah the velocity changes quite a bit so yeah if you go from air at one temperature to air at another temperature the velocity changes pretty regularly i should also mention that there's two types of waves there's a transverse wave which is sort of like an ocean wave. I won't tell you it's exactly like, because if you actually were in clear enough water and you got out past the breakers, what you'd see is when the wave is coming to you, you would dip down and, and out the sea because the wave is pulling you back. And then the wave would bring you to the top and then leave you and you'd actually end up transcribing a little circle and you could tell by looking at the bottom and seeing say a hermit crab or a skate or some trash or seaweed or whatever what you'd see is that you you basically went out towards sea as the wave was coming to you you were lifted uh and then were directly over the same spot uh as the trough occurred and then you came back this way so ocean waves are both uh longitudinal waves and transverse waves. Transverse would mean you only moved up and down from the wave. Uh, longitudinal would mean you only moved in and out from the wave. But in the case of an ocean wave, at least before it breaks, you're doing both. So it's a combination thereof. Uh, if you go in front of, say, the, the uh, second, uh, the second well, basically, I was going to use some terminology that I use from diving, but uh, basically there's sandbars out there and sandbars sort of dictate where the wave's going to crash because sandbar makes it shallower and the wave crashes as a function of, of depth. But if you get in close enough, the wave will crash. And when the wave crashes, definitely the wave is carrying matter with it. Uh, you can't say that's the case with a wave normally but with a wave that's longitudinal sometimes the matter is just oscillating back and forth but in a crashing wave the wave is actually being thrown forward that's why it's so hard to get out to sea or sometimes hard to get back in uh what else oh yeah so longitudinal wave versus transverse wave if you really want to think about a longitudinal wave that's what sound waves are but the best way is imagine me holding a slinky and then I walk all the way across my office and hand, say, my wife, the other end of the slinky. And then I take the slinky and I push towards her and then pull back, push towards her and then pull back, push towards her and turn back. Each time I push towards her, all the little rings of the slinky are getting compressed together. That's called compaction. And then as I pull back, all those little spring rings are separating uh, and that's your books calling it expansion. And the term originally was rarefaction. I know it seems to me like it should be rarefaction, but it's rarefaction. So compression, rarefaction. So what you see is the actual oscillation is going the same direction as the velocity. The wave that I pushed on the slinky went that way. And the oscillation was parallel and anti-parallel to it. A transverse wave like an electromagnetic wave, which includes the gamma rays, X-rays, microwaves, uh, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, and radio waves, 
all of those are electromagnetic waves. They're actually consists of an electric, or excuse me, electric field oscillating in one plane, a magnetic field in a perpendicular plane, and both of those perpendicular to the velocity. And when you have that, when you have the oscillation perpendicular to the velocity or the propagation, then that's a transverse wave. Earthquakes have both a P wave and an S wave, and the S wave is a transverse wave. And because it's going through material, uh, you can't actually have a, tra a transverse wave going through liquid. That's part of how we figured out the inside of our, or the outer part of our core of the earth is a liquid uh, core. And then inside of that is a solid, which we couldn't really tell from waves, but we can tell by creating the exact same conditions at the surface of the earth. And it turns out based on what the earth is made of, which is nickel and iron and stuff of that sort, given the pressures and temperatures that it's at, there's an equilibrium point where it switches back to a solid in the inner core. So our, our earth is an inner core solid, outer core, uh, which is a spherical shell, if you will, of liquid. And then outside of that, everything's solid again. But uh, we know that partly because transverse waves, which are the S waves, and P waves, which are the longitudinal waves, uh, travel differently and bend according to materials that are in there and, and so on and so forth. All right. So I think that covers enough of the details of the different types of wave motion. You can look, there's standing waves as well. Uh, in fact, I got enough time to show you that. Let me uh, reiterate what happens uh, with a standing wave. Uh, which I've mentioned before, but maybe not as thoroughly as I need to. So if you have a string like that, I can take and give that string a little bump up. And what happens is I make a wave that's moving that way. Now this wave is going to hit over here. And as soon as it starts hitting over here, because that's locked down, the wall is going to pull the same direction on it and actually pull it upside down and it's going to try to come back. Now, if you time perfectly, you're sending out of the next wave with the returning of the previous wave, then you can actually set up a system where the wave at one instant in time looks like this. You wait a split second, it's going to be flat again and then you wait a split second later and it's going to be a trough that's basically uh constructive interference between the wave going in and the wave coming out and when the two peaks align you get that top part like this and when the trough two troughs align you get that trough part right there but when the peak and the trough align you get that midline right there, canceling each other out. Uh, the first two cases are called constructive interference, where I made the trough plus the trough and the uh, crest plus the crest. And then that middle one's called destructive interference. And if you watch Big Bang Theory, you've probably seen Sheldon in like the second or third episode. He goes to a movie theater and he starts doing these weird sounds in various places. Caw, caw, caw. And he goes, beep, beep. So he's actually looking for all the different high frequencies and low frequencies, looking for where those sound waves will bounce off each other and destructively interfere because that would be a dead area within the theater. So if you look for somewhere where it's actually adding up properly, then you'd find a better sweet spot, if you will. So that's what he was doing. Well, that's one way. If I actually increase the frequency, remember the tension in the rope is not going to change. So the velocity is going to stay the same. Uh, but if the frequency goes up, then the wavelength has to go down. So in fact, I might, in fact, find another wave. And this case, it's going to be a wave that does this and then that. And then the next second, it does this and then that. So uh, if we call this length right here L, that's the length of the string, uh, then what you'll see is that the length of the string is in fact 
wavelength over two. Remember, we can always use one cycle of the sine wave or one cycle of the cosine wave to represent a wavelength. And you see from here to here, that's obviously a, a half a wavelength. So that's why I knew that. We could also call that one times the wavelength over two. Now, in this case, down here, the next one, L is actually equal to two times lambda over two. And if I try yet again, a slightly higher frequency. Now, this time, what I'll get is something like this. And then the next instant, it'll be like something like this. Okay. Now in this case, the length of the string is three times lambda over two. And in fact, what we get is L is equal to N lambda over two when you have the ends being antinodes, or excuse me, the ends being nodes. I don't know why I said that the ends being nodes. So both of these ends are nodes. Uh, then, of course, this is a node. And then, of course, this is a node and this is a node. And so on and so forth. These, in fact, are antinodes. What this is called is the fundamental frequency. And then you have the first harmonic, the second harmonic, third, so on and so forth. And in fact, if you pluck a string, say an F string, it plays an F but it plays an F partly because some of it's the fundamental F, but some of it is the first harmonic, which is twice the frequency. And some of it's the, the second harmonic, which is uh, four times the frequency and so on and so forth. Uh, Excuse so me, Professor? What's that now? It looks like uh, N minus one to me. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It is N minus one, thank you. Uh, and that, yeah, that's how the nodes relate as well. Uh, now there's other instruments too. For instance, there is a organ pipe that has one end open and another end closed. In that case, you see that this ends an antinode and this end is a node. So this one has a length L that is equal to lambda over four. But you could also do something like this, where it would go. And then it's three lambda over four, and so on and so forth. So that's what happens when you have an open end and a closed end. And then there's also organs that have both ends open. And when that happens, you get something like this and this. You can see this one is a quarter wavelength, and this one is a quarter wavelength. So the whole thing is one half wavelength, which makes you think, okay, well, we'll also have perhaps something like that which would be a whole half wavelength plus a quarter plus a quarter. So that would be two halves of a wavelength. And then the next one would be three halves of a wavelength and so on and so forth. So this more or less repeats the pattern that we got for the double-ended uh, tide knot. Okay. Now, remember all those still, because the tension hasn't changed and the rope hasn't changed, the velocity is going to stay the same. And, and that's really how you uh, can deal with the uh, interference, destructive and constructive interference. I think that's about it. Uh, that's called standing waves, by the way. So that's section 15.9.
and uh, refraction and diffraction. We're not going to, I'm not going to do anything with that. Uh, again, there might be some simple plug and chug problems with the online test, but the actual final exam will not have any of that. So you guys are completely free to go. Uh, I will wait for the last person to leave. Remember uh, on Monday, uh, that is your actual, no, uh, today is Wednesday, right? Yeah, so you're Monday and Wednesday. So uh, Monday is an optional day. I will log on to see if anybody has any questions, but you're not required to attend. I'm not doing roll or anything like that, but you're just welcome to come and ask me questions. You can also set up appointments or you can attend uh, some of my sessions during class uh, at, at the actual campus. So have a good one, everybody. Stay safe and uh, keep an eye on your email. You'll know when I send stuff out to you guys. Anyone have any questions? Yes, I do. <laughs> Go for it, Kamla. Oh, <clears throat> this is for a problem that is mm -hmm. kind of tricky to me. Uh, okay. The one, the one asking for uh, how much work required to accelerate the protein from rest to a speed of uh, uh, 0 0.99 uh, C. Like, okay, gotcha. So I kind of get you know the concept how to solve this. But uh, the part that is uh, tricky to me is, uh, you know, when it is asking to to get the the answer in GEV. Ah, okay, gotcha. Or MEV. Yeah, that's actually a, a tricky little part. Let me let me give you an idea of that. So, uh, one point six zero two times ten to the negative nineteenth joules is equal to one electron volt. So it's basically, once you take 242, you'll find that the energy is the charge times the voltage. So if you take a charge of one Coulomb and put it through a voltage of one volt, then that's a uh, single Coulomb volt. But if you do that with an electron, then the charge is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 times one volt, and that's where the electron volt comes from. So you need that conversion factor uh, for starters. Now, if you look at E equals MC squared for say an electron, the electron has a mass of 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms, and C is 299, Seven nine two four five eight. I'm giving you way more than you need in terms of sig, uh, sig figs, but anyways, that's exactly what it is. In case you need a certain number of sig figs, uh, if you actually multiply that, you'll get nine point one oh nine e to the negative thirty one times uh, two nine nine seven nine two four five eight squared. And that gives me 8.187 times 10 to the negative 14th joules. So if I divide that by 1.602 times e to the negative 19, I get 5110.5. Electron volts, which is 0 0.511 MeV. Okay. Uh, notice that I moved the decimal six places to the left. That's the same thing as multi uh, I, basically I could counteract that by multiplying by 10 to the six. That's what the mega is. And that's a mega electron volt. We could also say it's 511 kilo electron volts. So with that in mind, you all of a sudden have a neat new conversion. You can start calling the mass. You can say the mass of the electron, instead of talking about it in kilograms, you can say its mass is 511 keV per C squared. And uh, that's something that we often use. 
Uh, and in fact, we'll then switch to units where C is equal to one. And uh, that's where the dilemma comes in because it doesn't look like units are working anymore. And that's because in that weird system, they've sort of said that one meter and one second are the sort of the same units, uh, the conversion factor being C, but in that system, C is uh, exactly one. So if you figured out how to do the work, it's just a matter of converting back and forth between the uh, joules and the, and the KEV or the GEV or the MEV. G is 10 to the ninth, capital M is 10 to the sixth, and K is 10 to the third. Do you think you now know how to do it, or is there something deeper that you didn't understand? I, I, I did research this one, uh -huh. the one you just gave me, and I, I use it, but it's, it's just not giving the, the right answer. Now, did you use the energy is equal to p squared c squared? Yes. Okay, so I, you did use that part. Let me, uh, just to remind you, the energy, according to relativity, E squared is equal to P squared C squared plus M squared C to the fourth. Uh, you can use P is actually equal to gamma times MV, where gamma is one over the square root of one minus V over C squared. And uh, that will get you the momentum. But the easier thing is realizing that you're trying to convert your work straight into kinetic energy. And to do that, you need the equation for kinetic energy, which is gamma one minus one times M C squared. So if you plug in the V equals 0 0.99, I think it was 999C or it might've been 0.99C. If you plug that in, then you know what gamma is. And then you can uh, take gamma, subtract one from it, and then multiply it by mc squared. That will give you an, an energy in joules. Or, since it's an electron, if you use the 511 keV or the 0.511 MeV, you would automatically have that this part for an electron is equal to uh, 0 0.511, actually it's 51109 MeV. So that might get you a little closer. Okay, uh, I'll try it again. And if uh, it doesn't work, then Monday. Yeah, or I can, or I can I even set up a Zoom meeting with you and help you work it out in, in real time, but on video uh, so that you can see me. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, text me as opposed to to uh, emailing me because I I'll get my text a little quicker and I know you know time is of the essence. What is your phone number, please? Let me put it in the in the chat because this video is going to go out on the internet and I don't need that. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> here, here it is, and it's also on my syllabus, by the way. All right. Too far. There you go. I'm going to say it out loud. That would have sort of defeated the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> you see it now, comma. Yeah. Yes, I see it. Right. I hope that helps. And, and of course, you all are welcome to email me. I mean, text me like that. Uh, I definitely want you to do it. If I, if you send me an email and I haven't replied to you, that's the whole purpose I gave it to you for, because I don't always catch my emails. Sometimes they end up in the metaverse or something where I, I can't find them. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. See you, buddy. Hey, hey. Professor Younger. Yes, sir. Um, Is the midterm going to work like the final for me? like regarding the day night class thing. Yeah, you uh yeah, I'll just you text you or something. Time. Yeah, you can do it uh you can do it during our class. Uh, actually, I, I think Maria's not doing lab anymore. I think she sh she should be finished. So you can actually do it during the regular class, but you can also do it during the day if you want or you can do it uh wherever Maria is having her uh lecture uh lab i mean course final you just have to let me know about that but it'd probably be better if you just did it during the class uh the normal class period which is like 5 20. yeah start... yeah i was just thinking i, I would do it around the uh, the 5 20. Uh, okay yeah that's i would just problem. text you or something yeah. for the, the code would that work like yeah, last time? Work. yeah okay 
also I was thinking about doing your physics two class during the summer. Mm -hmm. Um, how much like more intense would you say it is compared to like a normal 15 week class? Like, um, I will tell you that 242 is, is uh pretty brutal mathematically. I think this summer I'm going to, I'm going to transition a little slower. So it actually might be a little easier than it has been in the past, but it is not trivial. Uh, there's a lot of math in 242. So we're doing surface integrals. We're doing line integrals. Uh, we're doing curls, divergences, uh, gradients, uh, stuff like You're that. Breaking up. You, you oh. broke up a little bit, Professor Younger, the last Sorry like, 10 that. seconds. Okay. Uh, I'm just saying that it's uh, 242 is a little more intense than 241. And during the summer, it's not trivial. Uh, that being said, the students that take it generally do pretty well. I don't really have any, I have very rarely does anybody fail my classes. And in fact, most of them make, you know, there's normally one or two a semester that'll make a C or a D, but virtually everybody's making A's and B's, but it is much harder during the summer. If you have the ability to take it in the fall, uh, it would be much easier on you, but still pretty difficult. Okay, cool. Um, I, I just like to get stuff done rather than wait around sort of thing. You can um, do it. I wouldn't take any other classes with it during the summer. That's for sure. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And then um, also, so remember previously when I had, I did a lab uh, that you canceled oh, on during that. the day. Right. I had two. I also did the one last week, I believe, or the week before, whichever one, I think it was April 10th, you canceled class mm -hmm. for the day. I also went to the lab during that nighttime. So I was wondering if I could just substitute the last two labs as like, I don't have to go to it or do I still need to? Because I can uh, send you. Is, is she giving you a lab final? Is that what you're trying to get out of? Yeah. Okay. I don't, I, that would be something that she'd have to probably agree with. Well, I don't have a lab. Uh, well, do we have a lab final for the day class? Because no, she no, said I don't that do if. That Oh, okay. She, she said, I don't need to take it then. She said, okay. uh, if you don't have one in Professor Younger's class, you don't need to take it. But I was saying, I went through two of the labs that... Um, yeah, I remember you, that. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, that's no problem. Uh, I, okay. In fact, she'll just turn in your lab grades that you have, and I'll work with that, and I'll probably give you a little boost because you did do a couple labs that we didn't do. Okay, sweet. I'll just send them to you uh, via email. Is that perfectly fine? Yeah, and she's going to send them to me too. So yeah, even if you don't, it's not a big deal. Okay, sweet. Um, also, one more thing. Monday the 24th, right, is uh, when the final is, right? Uh, yeah. For you okay. guys, uh, you're a Tuesday class. No, you're you're the Monday class. So, no, it's actually supposed to be Wednesday. Okay, the Wednesday the 26th. Six. Mm -hmm. Okay, sweet. Just wanted to confirm that with the 520 class. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's Wednesday because we actually meet on Monday after, well, I say we meet. The class has a meeting time on Monday, so I always just leave one day loose. That's why we have it on Wednesday as opposed to Monday. Gotcha. Okay, sweet. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a good one, John. All right, you too, Professor Younger. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, uh, The I'm going to do the uh, final at the testing center. Yes. And they... They wanted me to uh, relay to you to send them the information they need for the final. Okay, and this is uh, it shows as video. Yes. Okay. All right, that makes two students. I got to do, and I already, I already have a time uh, for the twenty sixth to, six to go in there for it too. They just said they need some information from you. No problem. Yeah, I, I normally do that, and they, they require it two days in advance at least, so that's why it's not up there yet, but I'll definitely take care of it for you. Okay, and you, the uh, practice final is going to be posted? Um, yeah, so hopefully it'll be posted tonight. I Like I said, I think I've already made it. It's just a matter of me finding it instead of the thing I put up there, but yeah, it'll be up there. If it's not there by tomorrow morning, can I text you to let you know? Yeah, definitely do that. There. Yeah, that that would be a good reminder, but I, I should be able to get it to you tonight. Okay, thanks. No problem. Have a good one, guys. Yeah. Randall, do you have any questions, bud? Yeah, I'll, um, I do have a question. Are you dropping two of the online tests or just yes. one? Yeah, okay. two. So, uh, and that's because, like I said, I, I I just posted. I think for you guys, I posted three tests, and I don't didn't want you to feel all stressed out about all those tests. But to be honest with you, 
each of those three tests will be infinitely helpful in you prepping for the final exam. So uh, you're not missing anything by doing those as opposed to taking practice finals because they really will help. Okay, perfect. And then you just said you're going to update it tonight. All right, cool. Yep, yep. And I'll email everybody when I make uh, changes to that stuff. Sounds perfect. I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Have a good one. Bye, everybody.